and renowned uh, uh, poet, uh, uh, social activist, independent media activist, and the uh, warrior, the forefront warrior for the uh, gender equality struggles. So, we welcome Comrade Nandini for this uh, online lecture. Uh, please start. Thanks, Kabir. Uh, so, I'm going to so uh, I would actually begin a little bit with what we understand by the term gender. And I think that one of the ways in which we popularly understand gender within the communist movement and within the left movements as such, that gender is about women, right? So the moment we actually talk about even the kind of the title, the gender class, uh, interlink in social revolution, we are automatically geared towards thinking about the question of women, women's inequality, and I think the way we have historically termed the issue within the kind of the communist movement is the woman question. And the first thing is I would actually like to move a little bit away from that and would begin by saying that the moment we begin to think of gender in the social revolution, in movements, in struggles, we also need to think of not just women as gender or femininity as gender, but we need to think about masculinity, we need to think of manhood, we need to think of what does it mean to live one's life as a man, and what are the constructions through which a man lives his life. So what I'm actually pushing towards is that in order to understand where we stand with the issue of gender and gender ideologies right now, within the very idea of the social revolution, and I think that we all of us would probably agree that these are extremely complicated times and also the very issue of gender actually has become, again, one of the primary thrusts of the reactionary movements globally, both in India, in the US, with the right of uh, the abortion rights being endangered again. So if we actually think about our very moment, it's a moment where the gains made by the women's movement in the last 50 to 70 years or so globally are increasingly being taken away. So in this context, we actually cannot think of the very understanding of gender without a consideration of the role played by masculinity and ideologies of masculinity. And I would be even more specific to say that this is precisely the time when we actually need to think about masculinity as it has operated within the communist movements. So what if I actually have to sum it up in one sentence, I would say that right now any effort to critically understand the significance of the women's question per se within the very idea of revolution, we also must have a critical understanding of men's question. So what do I actually mean by that? So what do I mean when I actually say that we need to regard manhood or masculinity critically? So, and when we, I'm talking about masculinity or manhood, it's now, there is a difference between, uh, from talking about gender as uh, a woman question, as a question of femininity, right? And part of it is that the moment we shift the gaze, we shift our critical attention to questions of manhood and masculinity, we actually have to think about the issue of domination. We actually have to think about how masculinity forms the dominant factor in the context of gender oppression and a critical understanding of how masculinity, masculine domination, these things are expressed and reinforced within the kind of the social and state institutions at large. We cannot just think of the question in terms of marginality and inequality. We actually have to shift our political focus to issues of how domination as it works in terms of gender, it's often expressed. In case of India, we also have to be really attentive to the issues of class and caste and religious identity and the way 
they actually intersect with and affect a man's ability to exercise masculine domination. And I think, again, we would all agree that not all men exercise masculine domination in the same way, exactly in the same way, in the same way that not all women experience patriarchy or inequality in the same way there are issues of class there are issues of caste there are issues of religious identity <laughs> you can look into it globally there are issues of race national identity so these are things that do actually affect one's ability to be either a man or a woman within the world at large and moving our focus back to the revolutionary organizations, left organizations, communist parties, um, I would actually uh, state that within such organizations, masculinity has historically provided the framework to express oneself politically. Let me repeat, so within left organizations and political formations, within revolutionary organizations, including the communist parties, masculinity has historically provided the framework to express oneself politically. So much so that if we keep our focus on that point of how masculinity has formed that dominant framework to express oneself politically, the revolutionary organizations have come to mirror the patterns of domination that one finds elsewhere within the society at large. So, what does that mean? So, for example, if I have to take a step back, I would say that there cannot right now be any understanding of a revolutionary politics that deals with the women's question that also does not talk about changing our ideas of masculinity in a radical and profound kind of a way. And no. that change, that transformation would also mean that how men actually experience gender ideologies as they continue with their lives and as they kind of reinforce such gender ideologies should change in a radical and profound kind of a way. And in practical terms, such changes would also involve men questioning the multiple forms of male entitlement uh, and earned privileges which have been granted to them precisely because they are men. So, in a way, what I'm also talking about that there cannot be any kind of women's empowerment without men giving up significant chunks of their power and women's empowerment to good also come to mean a significant and political disempowerment of men as men. And in a way, I think that oftentimes this idea of the simultaneous empowerment of women and disempowerment of uh, men can actually cause certain kinds of disruptions in the way we have known the organizations in the left, in the same way we have known the organizations that we term as kind of a radical left, revolutionary left, and I would say that they would also mean a radical restructuration of the communist parties as such, of the communist organizations as such. And one of the things that this process would entail is that there would be no fleeing from the questions of one's masculinity. There would be no question of fleeing from one's question of one's experience of being able to assert certain kinds of male domination by hiding behind one's political identity as a communist. So what I'm actually trying to say is that there is no gender neutral notion of being a communist. And especially at this present moment in history, what I'm also trying to say that uh, there is a communist simply by being a communist cannot actually live one's life over and above the social gender ideologies and thinking through those gender ideologies on an everyday basis is precisely what uh, that would entail a certain kind of interlink between gender and class. And if I now shift my focus a little bit to 
the question of women's movement because I think that if you think about it historically, women's movement and feminism are the kinds of spaces where questions of gender and gender ideologies have been brought in uh, in a way that matters, in a way that we are forced to pay attention. So the first and foremost, in the same way, as I said, that all women do not experience patriarchy in the same way. So there cannot be a singular and homogeneous understanding of women's movement. And uh, precisely because there cannot be any singular and homogeneous women's movement, there would be conflicts between the women's movement that would be led by communists with the other, like communists and leftists with the other forms of women's movement. And I would, and as much as I think of the women's movement uh, is related ultimately to the kind of struggle to end patriarchy, it's not going to be a very unified single layer movement either. So in, on the one hand, I would say that the struggle to end patriarchy must involve at least two registers, two layers and stages. And one register would be the women's movement as it has been classically understood, as it has been classically practiced. So, and if I actually have to give a very broad definition of how it has been classically understood and practiced, if we normally understand when we talk about women's movement, we actually understand the struggles and social movements to ensure women's rights, to grant upon women rights not yet at work, and the struggle to transform women into political and revolutionary subjects. And I think that increasingly globally, <laughs> women's movements are also faced with the dust to conserve uh, the rights that actually have been granted to women through the kind of the relentless struggle through the relentless movements in the last 70 years or so. So in a way, uh, our contemporary movements, like a lot of the other rights movements, actually forces the women's movement to play a conservative role in that not a whole lot of new issues of rights are being thought about, but what the women's movements and women's organizations are struggling is precisely to hold on to the rights granted to them. Um, having said that, what would be the second, and I think that this is, there is a common understanding, there is a kind of, this is the commonsensical understanding of women's movement, and I'm not saying much that is new in here where I would actually like to intervene that this is not, this alone, this form of movement uh, to kind of acquire and ensure women's rights would actually take care of the problem of patriarchy as such. And the second register, and so, uh, so there is a need to think of a second register and that second register is going to be a far more complicated movement that would be situated on a much higher plane. And that plane consists of a larger anti-patriarchal movement. And that larger anti-patriarchal movement would involve both men and women. So let me repeat that plane or the advanced stage or the more advanced stage of that anti-patriarchal movement would involve both men and women. And without that kind of second plane of the anti-patriarchal struggle which involves both men and women, the first plane that is the women's movement is bound to be incomplete and it's even going to be, and I would go so far as to say that it's going to be even extremely unwieldy in generating results that would aid any kind of revolutionary change. And I think that in the, we are living during, again, we are living during our um, uh, times, in our contemporary times, we are witnessing this unwieldiness in multiple ways. So on the one hand, if we really look into our movemental spaces, as well as the kind of the civil society at large, what we do see by and large that the last 50 to 70 years of uh, mobilizations done by the women's movement, done by the women's organizations, have produced a certain kind of empowerment in women. And there is much space to talk about the political ramifications, uh, the political characters of that empowerment, but there has been an empowerment undoubtedly. Uh, and I think that in lots of ways, as we see it within the movemental spaces, that 
men somehow have not actually caught up with the kind of the development of an empowered femininity, which leads us back to the questions of backlash, which uh, I think we see globally in terms of uh, how the states are dealing with the issue of empowered femininity, but also I think that uh, in our present times, especially in India, with the kind of, especially within the student and youth movements, we are seeing this question of uh, kind of a contradiction between a certain kind of empowered femininity and a certain kind of masculinity, which is sort of still struggling to catch up with this empowered femininity. Uh, through the kind of the very everyday ramifications of the Me Too movement, through the everyday specter of the issues of sexual harassment and sexual violence, as it has continued to invade the kind of the spaces of the social movements. And I'm not going into a lot of details into this at this point, but uh, would love to kind of talk about it during the question and answer if you have any questions. But I think that it is extremely important to keep track of this backlash both at the political and structural plane uh, globally as well as to think of how actually this unwieldiness uh, causes certain very specific contradictions within the left movement at this point um, and I think that part of it is that women kind of refuse to be silent anymore in a uh, uh, and again, we might actually think about what do those articulations mean? What do women's articulations, as we have come to witness them in the recent past, what are their political characterizations? And like everything, they would actually have to be read critically, dialectically. So I'm not glorifying them or creating a narrative of uncritical glorification, but I, it is important to keep thinking about the complexities of such non-uniform developments which have been generated through the kind of a lot of important work done by the women's movements and feminist movements in the last few decades. So what would, I mean, now if I actually have to kind of sum it up, that what would be the significance of such an approach that I'm talking about? So I am actually moving away from an approach that is based primarily upon including more women within the folds of the organization. Yes, uh, we need to have more and more women within the organizations. Women need to be represented within the committees, within the kind of the other structures that they built up. But at the same time, that inclusion can really turn into a form of representational politics. It can turn very fast into a form of uh, a politics of tokenism, which as I have experienced it, and I'm sure that a lot of you have also similar experiences, it's not going to resolve the contradictions and questions generated by patriarchy. So one of the, and again, I would emphasize that we need to move away from an approach that is based primarily upon including more women within the folds of the organizations. Instead, what I would say that we need to think of entering upon a process where the gender question within the revolutionary organizations is dealt with in an ideological and political manner. And I would repeat that one more time, gender needs to be made into an ideological and political category, into an ideological and political question within the revolutionary organizations and within the revolutionary movement as such. And I think that that's where for we have been struggling, right? I mean, that's precisely where uh, the global left has been struggling in multiple ways. And while uh, a lot of headway is being made and I think that in India we are also not quite sure. We don't really know how to grapple with the fact. We know that there is a problem of patriarchy. We know that this is something that needs to be dealt with. But how do we actually turn the gender question into an, a question of the ideology and politics within the left revolutionary organizations? We are not quite sure of that. To go back to a kind of larger canvas that why is it so? Why we are struggling with, with this kind of very idea of 
um, putting the question of gender in an ideological and political manner on the table. And I would say that gender has historically posed a problem for much of Marxist communist thought almost from the very moment of its genesis, right? And somehow this is presented with a problem that we have not quite been able to um, get a grip of even after the more than 150 years uh, have passed after Marx wrote his texts. Um, and it's not just a theoretical problem, uh, although even that would be a uh, uh, would be a moment of crisis. It is a problem which is both theoretical and at the same time it's reflected within the organizational structures, within the organizational politics of the communist parties, within its practical the way it practically has conducted the movements, within the ways in which it has practically uh, conducted its politics, within I mean if I can say within the kind of the communist everyday as such. And to go back to Marx for a moment. I would point out a couple of observations. One is that uh, we often talk about Marx's kind of analysis centering on class. And I would say that you know there is a problem in thinking about Marx's work as, uh, 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 as a body of thought that deals primarily with class. As I said, class is a symptom that appears in Marx as he is trying to deal with capital as he's trying to deal with capital as an abstract entity. So class really becomes a very material embodiment of uh, a lot of the abstractions, of a lot of the abstract operations of capital that he's trying to think through. So if we actually begin to expand and extend on Marx's work, I don't think we automatically go to that stage or go to that assertion that Marxism is about class, although that is, that is how it has been translated for us for generations. So what I would rather say that Marx's own work was focused primarily on the issue of class as a material embodiment of the abstraction of capital that he was dealing with. And in order to do so, he centers on a specific kind of work. And that specific kind of worker happens to be a male worker, predominantly white, working in a factory. And let me repeat that one more time. So Marx's analysis centered on a specific kind of worker, and that worker happens to be a male worker, predominantly white, working in a factory. So if you actually look into what I'm huh? saying, along with well, the uh, intersections uh, of masculinity uh, and the question of class, I'm actually bringing in another category, uh, which is race, right? So the whiteness. And I don't think that one can also think of uh, specifically Marxist huh? work so without thinking of also the issue of <laughs> whiteness, without the issue of race, which, again, is not the basis of the Indian context. So we would actually think of class. So without class, there cannot be any question of class in India. Without the both the issues of class and class, there cannot be any questions of gender. And again, and I know that I'm making certain long and complicated and somewhat abstract claims. I would act if there, I would love to go back to them and during the Q and A. So, but I just wanted to kind of throw this on the table. So I think that what we are left with then. Uh, because Marx actually deals with a specific kind of worker, the way Marx's work has been translated in most of the subsequent Marxist communist thought that the very category of worker comes to be understood as male. The factory also comes to be understood as the primary locus of class struggle. And also, of course, if we look into the history of much of the Western Marxism, especially in uh, United States, especially in uh, England, in France, more or less kind of the world of the imperialist powers, 
have emerged as these two categories within the kind of the indian feminist struggles which somehow have the power to tear all the work that have been done in the past 100 years asunder and we are all kind of trying to grapple with them um now what does that mean when we think of that how the identity of the worker in the communist movements have been understood as primarily male and what are some of the uh, practical ways in which uh, this idea has been lived. So number one, oftentimes the fact that the identity of the worker is being understood primarily as male remains unarticulated within our everyday movements, within the movemental spaces. And the absence of this distinct articulation of the gender identity of the worker leads the organizations and the movements to fall upon what I would call a default patriarchy. So patriarchy really becomes the common minimum upon which we organize. Patriarchy becomes the reality, the unquestioned reality upon which we build up our movement. And again, I'm sure that all of uh, us can actually come up with several examples. And uh, again, during the Q&A, I would love to go into some of the specific examples and how such examples can actually enable us to think of this abstract question of default patriarchy within left organizations in a more specific kind of a way. And the patriarchal relationships and patriarchal ideologies come to form the dominant political unconscious of our movements. And class struggle comes to be understood. And again, oftentimes, and there has not been much theorization and deliberate conscious articulation as a struggle between two classes of men, where women sometimes operate as secondary aids helping hands and sometimes as symbols. Let me repeat this one more time. And the last two points that patriarchal relationships and patriarchal ideologies come to form the dominant political unconscious of the movement and class struggle comes to be understood often in a really unarticulated and unpurized kind of a way as a struggle between two classes of men where women sometimes operate as secondary helping hands and sometimes as symbols. Now, if we actually go back to Marx's exclusion, um, so uh, yes, so if Marx actually, Marx's theorization involves primarily the worker who is male, who is working in a factory and who is predominantly white, does that mean that that was how Marx was living? in the kind of the 19th century as he was going about this work of theorization. And I would say no, right? But there are certain very critical exclusions that we find in Marx's work, which we now actually have to go back to as uh, the 21st century communists. So for example, if we actually look into the uh, kind of the uh, mid 19th century Europe, especially uh, London and Paris, especially England and um, France. Uh, one thing we would say that there are a vast number of poor women who are mostly young and who are employed as dressmakers and tailors in the kind of the developing fashion industry in London, Paris, Manchester. So in other words, if we actually begin to think of the textile mills uh, uh, as kind of the cotton mills where much of Marx and Engels's work are focused and uh, we also have to think about the fact that the relationship between the cotton mills and genesis of Marxism remains deep uh, since Engels's family owned cotton mills and much of the financing of Marx's work happened through the income generated in the cotton mills so much so that Marx's wife Jenny Marx 
uh, lovingly used to call Engels our cotton lord. So in a way, we also we have to begin to think about the continuum of cotton as it had dominated the 19th century capitalism. Uh, the, uh, cotton doesn't quite end in itself as a commodity. So a continuum also involves the finished clothing, right? And that finished clothing did not actually happen without the involvement of huge number of women workers, which if you actually, and this is not something that I'm saying that I'm kind of discovering myself uh, all on my own. So if you actually read through the kind of the French and British literature of the era, the creative literature, the novels, the short stories, the lives of these women workers have been well documented and so much so that this presence of this huge number of women workers, often single, um, actually caused a certain kind of sexual crisis within the middle class society of the 19th century British and French cities and the concern that these are the women who are no better than prostitutes, who are indeed living the life of the prostitutes and therefore hurting the lives of, kind of the respectable lives of the proper French and British um, middle class. So in a way, there are women workers in Marxist time too, except for the fact that they're not working exactly in the kinds of factories that Marx is looking into. Although, I mean, again, if we, uh, that's also a kind of misnomer. If we look into Engels' factory, there are women workers in there, right? If we look into the conditions of the working class in England, the very ethnographic work that Engels writes, there are women workers there in cotton mills too, and cotton mills begin their production with the involvement of huge number of women workers and children. And so much so that, uh, I mean, Engels' love relationships are with the kind of the women employed to, um, in his factory, right? So, I mean, both of Engels' kind of lovers, they were basically factory hands, as the uh, word used to be, um, in the factories that he was owning or his family was owning at the time. So anyway, so in other words, what I'm trying to say that there are women workers who are present in the geography in the kind of the economic geography, in the geography of production that Marx is describing, except for the fact that they do not make an entry into Marx's work as women. And neither do they actually make an entry into Marx's work as women workers who might have specific problems that <coughs> can confront only women workers. Second of the exclusion in Marx's work is the plantation industrial complex uh, in the Americas, in the Caribbean, in the United States, the southern part of the United States, and the vast amounts of black slave labor, which would provide the raw material to the factories which formed the primary center of Marxist analysis. And once slavery would be abolished in 1833 in the Caribbean world, they would actually have indentured labor from our subcontinent, right? Mostly from Bihar to actually fill in the empty spaces of the plantations. So in other way, if we again look into the global geography uh, of economic production that Marx is talking about, the global geography of capitalism that Marx is talking about, both gender and race are very much there, gender and race cannot be separated from the questions of class and capital. To go back to my earlier observation that Marx is not necessarily, talk Marxism is not necessarily about class, but it's about capital. Capital is reformulating the life of both women, the very understanding of gender ideologies as they have been, as well as Capital is bringing up a notion of race which did not quite exist before uh, capital makes its inroads into the African coasts to get free slave labor, right? So free poor labor. So in uh, other words, capital is making huge changes in the world as it has been known beginning from the late 17th century and 19th century is pretty much the time when that transformation kind of attains its peak. And there is no way this question of this transformation of capital can be dealt with without thinking about the intersecting issues of gender and race, which continue to affect class in very significant ways. Thank you.
these two factors, gender and race, and they do appear in Marx's work. I mean, Marx writes uh, quite a bit about the civil war in the United States. He were, his own brother-in-law, Jenny Marx's brother, actually emigrates to the United States and much to Marx's embarrassment, enrolls himself in the Confederate Army, in other words, the army which was fighting to conserve slavery in the southern part of the United States. So there cannot be, I mean, we cannot make the excuse that Marx didn't know about any of these things. Marx knew them very, very well, but these somehow did not actually form the primary thrust of this analysis. And I'm not saying that in order to pathologize Marx, but I'm trying to say that, you know, I mean, one can have only so much time in one's lifetime, but somehow gender and race did not appear in any integrated way it, along with class, along with the factory space of production in Marx's work. But they do appear, and especially in case of gender, as a form of political sentimentalism. Um, and in the same way, Marx stands for the right of the uh, <coughs> black laborers to be released from slavery. But the issue of race also comes to be explored in Marx's work as an issue of almost a metaphysical political question, one of political sentimentality, without necessarily thinking through the complexities of what does it mean to have a black body and to be a worker and try to have a conversation with a white worker in the same way Marx's work did not quite have the understanding of the deep analysis that what does it mean to have a woman's body and to be employed as a worker, as a dressmaker or a tailor in one of these factories and to interact with the way Marx understands class as a white male presence inside the factory. And I would say that in the succeeding generations, these are the kind of the loopholes, the gaps we are left with. And to go come back to the question of gender, these would also precisely, these absences would set the tone of gender-based organizing within the kind of the left revolutionary organizations, including those in India. And we are still kind of working through them. We are still trying to process what these absences mean. So what are those implications of these absences? One, there has been very little systematic theorization of gender. And this is especially true in case of the Indian Marxist feminist thought. Gender has been dealt with as a sentimental category rather than as a political category. And again, this is also extremely pertinent and I think especially pertinent for the Indian feminist uh, Marxist movements. In a way, we can, if we actually look a little bit into a lot of the propaganda materials we use, into the kind of the communist culture, into the kind of the pictures we circulate, into the kinds of poems we write, much of the exploration of how we actually talk about women's involvement within the movement, within the uh, whether it's the workers' movement or within the communist movement as such, it's not going to be much different than the kind of the RSS understanding of Bharat Mata. So it's just, uh, uh, and again, I can talk more about that, but gender appears primarily as a sentimental category. Women appear as, and think of all the kind of the pictures we have seen that the women appear in our iconography as a mother who is holding a gun in one hand and a baby on the other. And how is that different in any way from the representations of Bharat Mata that we get. It's not, I would say. So dealing with gender as a sentimental category then means efforts would be made to include women both within the kind of organizations, within the practical politics, within the movements, but without necessarily looking upon patriarchy as a complex political formation which intersects with class, capital, and state. Let me repeat that one more time. So dealing with gender as a sentimental category would mean that efforts would be made to include women within organizations, within specific campaigns, within specific movements, within 
within the committee structures, but without necessarily looking upon patriarchy as a complex political formation which intersects with class, capital, and state. In other words, gender would be dealt with as mostly a tactical issue and not an ideological political issue. Again, let me repeat that one more time, that gender would be dealt with mostly as a tactical issue and not an ideological political issue. And the fact that gender will remain as a tactical issue and not a political issue within our movements would be reflected within every aspect of the communist organizing within the communist movement, whether it's the everyday practices, whether it's the organizational structures, and the long-term orientations and directions of the revolutionary movements as such. And there are symptoms. I mean, if I talk about the symptoms, symptoms I think it would be a little easier to think of how such an abstract absence comes to embody itself in very material and practical ways within the communist movement as such. So, I mean, communists right, right? Marxists right, right? I mean, that's precisely uh, one of the things that they have done yeah. in the last 150 years. And uh, I think that no uh, student of Marxism or communism can say that they are done uh, with the entire body of work that the Marxist and communist theorists have produced in the last 150 years or so within, the, within one's lifetime. But interestingly, Ironically, that's not the case. If we actually look into the number of women theorists within the communist movement at large, so as such, the communist movement at large has produced very few women theorists. So, I would say that if anyone actually devotes oneself to reading the women theorists uh, globally, they would be done within six months, or at most it would be another year. And I think in India, the problem is even more acute uh, within, and also the whatever little women actually have succeeded to write, within the movement at large, these theorists are very rarely read. And I would give a concrete example just to make my point, I think that, and I think I belong to that generation uh, as a lot of others who are listening, that sometimes we would begin our kind of training in the movement, uh, and especially with the question, with, with the kind of the gender question, with women's question, with a reading of the conversation between Sarah Zetkin and Lenin, and we would sort of kind of use Lenin as an example. Okay, so this is how um, gender within the communist movement needs to be done. This is how uh, women within the communist movement need to live their lives, need to involve themselves within the movement. And in most cases, we would not actually even look into Clara Zetkin that here is this other woman who here is this woman who is actually in here, who is talking to Lenin, who is actually coming up with her own opinions of the movement, who actually has an immense contribution to the kind of the international communist movement at large. And she has written, she has written quite a bit. So Clara Zetkin would really be turned into a prop in our kind of evaluation of the gender question within the movement. And I think that I can kind of expand on my examples, but this is the commonest example which I think most of us have come across at some point in our lives. And in most practical way, I think we need to think about if we are talking about the symptoms, that how this absence of gender as a political category manifests itself within the communist movement at large, we need to think about the issue of the women's front within the uh, communist movement, within the kind of the, the way the parties organize themselves and the mass organizations that form that continuum that parties construct around themselves. So I would kind of come up with an observation that it's not always very clear either to the women who become activists in the women's front uh, as well as the other male comrades and, and within the party at large that what exactly are these women's organizations supposed to do, right? So uh, what does it mean to actually have a women's front and what is its political role? 
uh, within our movements. So, in practical terms, what do the women's friends do? I think they, I mean, in a most common kind of a way, they celebrate the International Working Women's Day, that is the 8th March, and that's when most of the times the women's organizations become most visible. There is a general understanding we have that in these organizations, poor women should be organized and organizing poor women within the bodies of this organization somehow takes care of the class question. And there is often also a kind of understanding that since it is a women's organization, we need to talk a little bit about issues that pertain only to women. For example, domestic violence, sexual violence in case of India at one point of time, dowry deaths and women's literacy. And I think all of these issues are coming back with much force, even in our our kind of urban middle class world right now and that these issues need to be addressed. And if I actually go back to, to what I began my uh, talk with, my conversation with, if we talk about domestic violence, sexual violence, dowry deaths, issues of women's illiteracy, or access to education or workplace, none of these are quite women's issues. There is also a kind of a concomitant issue of masculinity and masculine domination that perpetrates the violence on women to begin with. So there is no way we can actually ever deal with the problem of domestic violence or sexual violence without thinking about the question of masculinity, without also thinking about the question of masculinity within the communist movement at large. Um, and as we see, as we witness, women's organizations mobilize women to join the programs, right? The quote unquote central programs, and thus they add numbers to the presences. So if I actually kind of go back to what happens, like if I add up all of these things that I've said, that women become participants in the left movements. Uh, undoubtedly, I think that's one of the things we need to acknowledge, we need to think through, and that participation does mean a lot in certain contexts. It does mean that women are moving out of the kind of the domestic space into the public space of political action, into the public space of debates and thoughts, into the public sphere. But we also need to think about that this participation within the public space as it has operated within the left movements do not automatically lead to women becoming the intellectual and political agents of the communist movement at large. In, again, let me repeat that. Women have participated in the left movements in large numbers, but that participation, important as it is, has not actually led to women also transforming themselves into the intellectual and political agents of the communist movements at large, which I would say gives birth to certain fallacies and questions. So, which uh, go back to the issue of what the women's organizations are supposed to do. So, are the women's organizations then meant to address only economic issues that pertain specifically to poor women and I'm assuming women workers? If yes, that's the way I understand it. That's also the work of the trade unions, right? So, why do we need a uh, women's front to begin with? Uh, and again, if we actually read a little bit of Clara Zetkin, um, and I think that women communist theorists have been quite articulate and eloquent about the historical ways in which sexism, patriarchy, and male domination have worked within the trade union movements. And I think even in India in the last 10 years or so, we have experienced multiple movements, multiple trade union movements, but the issue of gender and patriarchal domination, male domination, male supremacy within the trade unions have come onto the surface. So uh, there is the like, there is the necessity of a serious anti-patriarchal struggle within the trade union organizations, <laughs> and of course that uh, struggle would actually have to be fought primarily by the women workers, but also the kind of the middle class trade union organizers 
So, but at the same time, this is a struggle that has to be fought within the trade unions at the kind of the at the plane of the trade unions. What the women's organizations are supposed to do. Um, so, in a way, is it the work of the women's front, the women's organizations, to introduce into the agenda of the trade unions the issues that specifically concern women as workers, which, as we know, and again, I can talk about it more during the question and answer session, that it include, includes the issue of sexual violence at the workplace, but it's not simply about sexual violence at the workplace. So is, is it then the work of the women's front to fight that battle within the uh, trade union? And I don't think that we are quite clear on that. And historically, it's still the